The whole Book of Mormon is centered on one focal point, isn't it? It's like a burning glass centered with ferocious concentration on one single point. What is there in those ninth and tenth chapters of Third Nephi that point that out? One little word that keeps hammering away, repeating and reading. What is that, Brother Clayton? Hmm? Oh, you're over here. I thought a voice came from up there. We thought I heard a voice, eh? Uh, I say the intense, the whole Book of Mormon is just centered on one person, isn't it? And who is that? Christ. Yes. And what brings that out very clearly with great power in those, in those ninth and tenth chapters when the Lord is announcing himself? Yes. What? He keeps repeating that word over and over and over again. Remember, it's divided, the ninth chapter is divided evenly into ten verses in which he said, I did all these awful things. And then he turns around and says, I give you all these blessings. This is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you eternal life and so forth. You belong to my family. You belong to me. I don't want to have to throw you out, you see. He's a, a, a ferocious plea. Now, those people who perished, have they lost their salvation forever? No, not at all. Well, we'll lay here the message, which they wouldn't accept here. First Peter, you know, yes, those spirits that were disobedient at the time of Noah, the Lord went down and preached to them, and he sent the apostles to preach to them. That's what you get out of, of this literature we're going to talk about today. Yes, this repeated I tells us that one person has been commissioned to do everything. Uh, is that a selfish or... And all those eyes sound very selfish and egotistical. Uh, Sister Cox? Sister Cox here? Right here. Oh, Sister Cox, hi. Uh, that sounds awfully egotistical. I did all this, I destroyed these things, and I and I alone will save you and, and bring you back, and you can live with me. Be one of, I'm of the same type of person as you are. I'm, I'm just, I belong to your universe discourse and everything. I can give you all these blessings. Does that sound very egotistical to you? It, it certainly does. We had, the only time I ever went to BYU, I went to a summer school uh, many years ago up at Alpen Grove, Aspen Grove. And we had a, they were very flattered to have this Rabbi Cohen there. He was talking, and uh, we were being very liberal in our ideas in those days, and says to, uh, Rabbi Cohen says, wouldn't I be an, a conceited ass if I were to say, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wouldn't I have been a conceited ass? Well, what's the answer to that, Miss Cox? Sister Cox? Uh, yeah. Yes, you, you would be a conceited ass if you said <laughs> You don't have to say it either to be a conceited ass. It came out all over the place, you see. Uh, if I were, would he be a conceited ass if he said, I invented the sewing machine? I'm a conceited ass if I go around boasting that because I didn't. You see, it doesn't happen to be true. But if it's true, if I did invent the sewing machine, I'm not necessarily conceited ass to say, yes, I invented it, as far as that goes. So the Lord can say this, but others can't, you see. The, uh, we're, God permits, is permitted to do things that men can't do. What are the, some of the things that, well, all this destruction and so forth, uh, Brother Darrow, Brother Darrow, the, uh, then uh, Brother Davis, I always have Davises, Welch are always with us. Uh, Del Castillo, Sister Del Castillo here. Oh, there you are. Uh, now, what do we have here? Uh, we have all this. Uh, what was I going to say anyway? The, uh, the Lord is speaking to them about the resurrection. He tells them that the, uh, all these things that he has done, and uh, they're true when he says them. What about the, uh, what about his actual coming? Now, this is a very important thing. Are the, is the story true and so forth? This, the whole thing hangs around this. If this is true, see, if it is so, if he is really the Redeemer and so forth, or did he really say it, or did he really come at all? Do you have any evidence of this? Do you have, right offhand, can you tell me uh, the evidence for such a person coming among the Indian tribes of America? I don't think there's a single tribe that doesn't have that legend, and what is it? The, the legend of the Lord of this earth? The legend, yes. The, I mean, even Indians knew about it. They all, and what, what is the legend called? It goes by various things. The legend of, 
the white god, remember? Uh, they have various things. These goes by various names, the Quetzalcoatl, you, you name it what you will. Uh, a book, there have been a number of collections of writings about that, I think. Uh, uh, what's his name has, has written about that. But uh, yes, the, uh, these legends are found everywhere, and of course they're all mixed up and they're all mixed and mangled and everything else. But you always get that main theme, how would all these people know about it and so forth. The, uh, remember, Cortes had an easy time because they thought he was the white god who was come back, you know. He had the beard and all the rest of it. And were, were they ever wrong and so forth. <laughs> Pizarro and the others took advantage of that, exploited it. And the, uh, all the tribes have that legends. The, uh, the variations show the usual signs of invention and contamination and elaboration. Uh, but Christians don't want to accept the story of the Lord coming back after the crucifixion. And this is an important thing, isn't it? The, the, uh, they don't like it at all. The, uh, I think the best thing would be to just briefly go through Acts here. Oh, not just Acts, but the, the account of it in the uh, New Testament. Let's do that. This is what happened. Now, did the resurrection really take place? Well, first, I guess we should mention this. Uh, there are 17 chapters in the Book of Mormon that repeat the teachings of Christ, the same that you find in the New Testament. Well, is that necessary if you have it four times? Uh, Sister Divet, is Sister Divet here? Divet? Sister Divet? Uh, is uh, Sister Edelson? Edelson, is she here? The uh, Brother Frost. Uh, is it necessary after having four Gospels to repeat the same thing word for word all over, all over again? Is this repetition necessary? Well, they, what he's saying here, what he said in the old world was they didn't know about it, they didn't have a record of it. Oh, he added something to it. But remember, f 17 of these verses are almost word for word out of the New Testament. Why is that necessary? Somebody, well, you might make fun of that and so forth. But what's the first question that comes to mind? How many Gospels are there? How many accounts are there in the New Testament? How many Gospels are there? Well, there's four Gospels. Four Gospels. It told four times in the New Testament. Well, was that necessary? Now you're right, you see. Why four? They, had, they did have different views, and especially on what subject? Where do they differ most widely? Whether they have different views, different reports. Some say they're very confusing and so forth. They're not confusing if you consider they come from different people. And their impressions, nevertheless, when you get to the story of the resurrection, they all go off in different directions. So we need a fifth gospel. We, we, we don't say there's nothing wrong with the fifth gospel because we know that he preached the fifth gospel, as we're going to talk about. That's the one he talked about during the 40 days, for example, when he came back and, and taught them. So this repetition is necessary here. And uh, the... Uh, this has fortified people's doubts that there should be four, that the gospel disagree, you see. You say, this is one of the main arguments against. Uh, they say, well, it's a fiction. The standard accepted doctrine today of uh, the return of Christ is that the, the Christians were so dedicated and so full of the Spirit and remembered him so vividly, their wishful thinking, that they incorporated him into, into a cult. They, they built a cult around his memory and his thought. And in that sense, in that spiritual sense, he would appear. And that's the sense in which uh, the Christian world accepts him as coming back again, and that only. You may think that's an exaggeration here. I think I'll have to read something else then. Uh, see, I brought the whole library along. Uh, the, so we say here, now the, the earliest... Where are we here? The earliest and greatest of the Christian theologians was Oregon, Oregon of Alexandria. He grew up in the, in the University of Alexandria, so he had a lot of fancy ideas. He came very early, and he influenced the others like nobody else. You say, well, isn't St. Augustine, for example, greater? St. Augustine is simply a paraphrase of Oregon. And so this is what we have here. Ah. When uh, these men speak, this, this was Oregon's reaction. Well, first of all, the Apostolic Fathers, the first writers after the Apostles, 
after the Old New Testament are the Apostolic Fathers. There are seven of them, and they begin with Clement and, uh, and Ignatius of Antioch, and uh, they go down the list, uh, Polycarp, and uh, so they're the, the Apostolic Fathers. First writings after, and the earliest of those are Clement and Ignatius. Now they're writing in the first century, right at the turn of the first, between 85 and 115. And this is what they say, what they're talking about. Ignatius is going to Rome to be sacrificed and to be martyred at that time. And he says, I know, well, the two charges constantly brought against the church members by the Apostolic Fathers, all of them charge the members of the church with this. They say, they're ashamed of the crucifixion and they deny the resurrection. Well, would you think Christians in the first century would start denying the resurrection as soon as they got it? I know that Christ had a body after the resurrection, says Ignatius writing to the Smyrnaeans, and I believe that he still has. There's no thought of a mystic body here, you notice. Ignatius pleads with the Tralians. He writes seven letters. He, he writes to the Tralians, too, to believe that Christ really and truly was born, that he ate and drank, that he was really and actually sentenced under Pontius Pilate, and was actually crucified and died, and that he really and truly was raised from the dead. But if, as certain atheists, that is, non-believers, say he only appeared to have suffered, why am I going to fight beasts? In the longer version, Ignatius rebukes those who don't believe in the resurrection. Others say God can't be known. Now, this is what the church was preaching already in the time of the apostles. See, uh, Ignatius is boast, uh, well, and then Polycarp is contemporary, that uh, the last to see John, they'd seen an apostle. And uh, others that think Christ was unbegotten. Others who claim that the Holy Ghost is not a reality. Others who say that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are the same. And so they go, and they're very much alarmed about it. And then comes the great Oregon, who's going to explain it all. You see, he joins the church, and he is the, uh, the great philosopher, and he's going to explain the gospel to his friends. He writes uh, a refutation of Celsus, who had written a document a writing against the church way back in, what, well, in 180. He says, we are stunned with the greatest amazement that this, the most eminent of all natures, that's Christ, putting off majesty should become a man. It is utterly beyond human comprehension that the word of the Father should be thought of as confined within that man who appeared in Judea. You know, in the Book of Mormon, he appears just as a man and mingles among them and so forth. That man who appeared in Judea. But that the wisdom of God should have entered the womb of a woman and been born a baby and cried and wailed just like other babies and had to have diapers changed and and then suffered death and said that his soul was sorrowful unto death and was led off to the most undignified of all deaths. Seeing such things, the human intellect is stopped in its tracks, so stunned with amazement that it knows not where to turn. It's far beyond our powers to explain. I suppose it even goes beyond the capacity of the holy apostles. Nay, it is quite possible that the explanation of this sacrament is beyond the powers of all celestial beings. The angels and God can't explain it, it's, because it shouldn't happen, you see. This is a, it to be, God is asomatous, is bodiless. He must be without any material contamination, the thing you had to accept. He, this is why he doesn't know what to think about the Lord. Well, so he gives his suspicions, and he goes on and, uh, um, well, cite St. Augustine here. I like St. Augustine. According to St. Augustine, resurrection of the flesh is the one thing the pagans cannot take, the one thing with which the philosophers have no patience, and above all, the one thing that distinguishes a Christian from a non-Christian. Since that's the one doctrine that makes Christians Christians, it's alarming to learn from Augustine what his idea of the resurrection is, he says. Nothing, in nothing, we're right, quoting Augustine here, is there so much conflict and con controversy among Christians themselves as on the subject of revelation, revela uh, resurrection of the flesh. See, the Christians themselves were fighting about nothing as much as re the one thing they could not agree on was that. <laughs> on no other matter, he says, do they disagree so vehemently, so obstinately, so resolutely, so contentiously as on the subject of the resurrection of the flesh. As far as the immortality of the soul is concerned, no question, he says. Many a pagan philosopher, too, has argued about that and bequeathed thus vast heaps of writings to the effect that the soul is immortal. But when it comes to resurrection of the flesh, they won't argue, but dismiss it out of hand as impossible, and that on the ground that it's impossible for this earthly flesh to aspire to heaven. And so we go on with the, with the various... I like the way the explanation that, uh, that St. Jerome gives, gives uh, to this. Um, Maybe we can find Jerome here. He says the... Uh, 
the resurrection of the heart of the Christian teaching. Well, anyway, he, I, oh, I can tell you right off what he says, of course. Ah, here we are, here. Coming on this, St. Jerome, talking about Oregon, writes a century and a half later, if all things, as this order of reasoning compels us to believe, shall live without a body hereafter, the whole universe of corporeal things shall be consumed and return again to the nothing out of which it was created. Now that's St. Jerome who gave us the Latin Bible, the official uh, Catholic Bible of Vulgate, and he believes that everything is going to return. Well, he says, because oh, we'll have to be resurrected in the flesh, because the scripture says we will have to be, but the moment we're resurrected, then we'll start dissolving. And very presently, we'll be dissolved into the nothing from which we came, the nihil. And uh, of course, we're, we're the, like the Buddhist, we're just a drop of water in the great ocean of being and return to nothing. But this is a very different story. This is so, so literal and so forth. Leave us, uh, look at some of these. I'm so bowled, up, bowled over by these. In Mark, you won't have a chance to turn to these, so we'll read them very quickly here from very reading and so forth. Oh, where's Matthew, for heaven's sake? Oh, here we are. Yes, the 27th Matthew. Now look what happens in the 27th chapter of Matthew. We've got to begin with Matthew here. In the 43rd verse, that's when they, they go to the tomb. 27 and 43. No, that, that isn't it. Must be the wrong chapters. Oh, 28, 1 and 2. I did this so fast this morning, I didn't have time to, to prepare it on that. Yes, late. It was very early on the Sabbath, when it was still dark. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary uh, came to look at the tomb. Theoresite on Tuffin. Caedus says plus again, and notice the Book of Mormon at the time of the crucifixion, and there was a tremendous earthquake as they went. Earthquakes are very common in that part of the country. You know, that's right on a very active earthquake belt. That's the, it's the Jauf, it's the Great Depression uh, sunk in there. That's a rift, the Great Rift. It runs right through Africa, right up through Palestine there. Well, and there was a terrific earthquake. Uh, and an angel of the Lord, having come down from heaven, Proselthon, Apiculison, came down and rolled the stone away from in front of the tomb. See? And then what happened? And they saw him. They, they say, well, it was, everybody says they rationalize. Well, obviously, it was the earthquake that rolled the stone away. But no, they say, we saw him, and he was like lightning, and his garments of him were white as snow. They always talk about the garments white as snow here. That's uniform. That, that is the, the basic white that's worn in the celestial kingdom. Uh, and those who were to there to perform the ordinances were scared to death. And they shook, they shook like the earth, and fell down as if they were dead. Those who were sent to watch the tomb, you see, the Peruntus, uh, to watch over to carry out the necessary protection of the tomb. Probably the Roman soldiers. He doesn't say they were the Roman soldiers, but they, they passed out and fell dead at the sight of the angel, as if they were dead. They couldn't take it. And the angel answered and said to the two women, though, she said to the women, don't be afraid. See, the angel always says, don't be afraid. There's the cultural shock. He says, don't be afraid of me at all. Oidegar uh, Jesu, for I know that, Jesus who was, that it is Jesus who was sacrificed, who was crucified, whom you're looking for. I know that. You won't find him here, Ukestihoda. Agerthen kaikathosipen, he's risen and gone just as he said he would. Come on and look if you don't believe me. Delta Iditon, they're always being asked to look and test and see with their eyes and so forth. Delta Iditon don't open off to a king. So come here and look. This is the place where they, they laid him. You see, he isn't there. And, uh, and then immediately, well, where they laid him immediately, having risen up, uh, yeah, but you, after they've seen it, see, then he says, Parvathesh, now you hurry off as fast as you can and tell what you've seen to the disciples, Odigirthan, that he has risen from the dead. Kaidu Prague, he must say, and then that he should meet them to, uh, in Galilee. Now, you see, this is just an angel and so forth, but they were absolutely overwhelmed at what, what had happened, actually. Kapakulith and Taku, uh, and he's to meet them there. And they did, uh, and they left the tomb with fear and rejoicing, 
They were frightened, they were overawed, very happy at the same time, with great fear and rejoicing. They ran as fast as they could and announced it to the apostles that Jesus had actually risen. He uh, painted now to us like And behold, I'm getting ahead of the story here. And behold, Jesus met them. He was, whom painted out came, met them, was standing right smack in front of them, came meeting them face to face, saying, hey, good morning. Here at the Greek word meaning, good morning, how are you this morning? And uh, it was, it was kerita. And uh, means tears, our word cheer comes from that kerita. Hide a person, thutum, a crotus, no tutus, polis. And when they saw him, they grabbed him by the feet so he couldn't go any further. And Jesus said, don't be afraid again, you see. You go and tell what you've seen to the brethren, to my brethren, Kai, and tell them that they should go to Galilee and meet with me and... Uh, Okay, and they'll, they'll, see, they'll have a chance to see me there. You notice there's appointments, there's goings and comings here. It, it's just a matter of, it seems like, regular everyday affairs. And you say the Christ spirit came into their hearts and he was everywhere and so forth. Nothing could be more down to earth. And all the Gospels keep, in, they keep rubbing it in all the time. Look, this is not the way you think it was, you see. Because you have this other idea. For a woman and thou torn to do. And then they themselves went and behold, the, uh, custod the custodian, use the Roman word custodian here, uh, coming to the city up in Galilee, uh, announced it to the high priest. Well, then they say that they plotted it and so forth. Well, we have to be getting along here because some, some better passages than that. You notice this is, and also, uh, then following 19, when he comes to them, per authentus, then they, as soon as he saw them, he came, well, well, just the 16th verse, the 11. The uh, eleven disciples did go to, uh, to Galilee, and they met him. And as soon as he met them there, he told them to go forth and teach and ba baptize. Go teach all people and baptize them. That's what he does right off in all the Gospels. Uh, almost as soon as he sees the apostles, he says, This is my Father's Gospel, go and baptize. Exactly as he does in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> he doesn't wait to tell them that part. Well, uh, it's the... Now, Mark has a nice touch in here, Mark 16 and 5. When they went and looked in the tomb, see this one says they saw the angel outside and he told them to look in the tomb. And the angel was brilliant and so forth. In this one they look in the tomb and they just see Aeneaniscan there. Aeneaniscan, he's a nice young man. It's a, it's a term of endearment, uh, caritative, a diminutive, Aeneaniscan. So in 16 and 5 of Mark we say, when they looked in the tomb, what did they see? And you know what it's, it's always defined in all the Gospels, not just Luke, with with clinical accuracy. They want to make sure that you know exactly what happened here. So, in Garmegasim, there was a terrible fear among them. And it was the first day of the Sabbath they went, and it, just before sunrise here, and uh, they said to each other, uh, who has uh, who's moved the, the stone and so forth. And then going up to the tomb, they saw a Neoniskin. A young man, a, means a, a youth, a pleasant one. Notice Iskos is a, a term of endearment. And Iskos, a nice young fellow, sitting there was all it was. He, he wasn't flaming or blazing like the other angel was. And Iskos, and he was sitting uh, on the, notice how accurate they want us to get it, how sure they want us to get it. He was sitting on the right hand, uh, uh, and he was clothed in a white robe, a stole after the manner of a Roman robe. And he was clothed in a white robe, an ordinary white robe. He, he wasn't a terrifying sight at all. Just a young fellow sitting there, and he was sitting on the right side of the place where he'd been buried. And they were absolutely amazed. That's as strong as you can make it. But he said to them, they use things, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that the times we should be here. Always have to be reassured. Jesus, whom you were looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene. Nazarene doesn't mean of the town of Nazareth. It means one of the, of the church, Nazarene. Uh, the crucified one. Well, he's risen and he is not here. This is the place where they laid him, but he's not here anymore. But you go and, and then tell the apostles and tell, uh, tell Peter, who is in charge of them, that they shall all go and meet, me, meet him in Galilee, and then they'll have a chance to see him there. So that's the same part of the story. And uh, they all had a hard time believing it, you know, all of these things, until they saw it. And then even then they were amazed and had to be pacified and so forth, because it was both ordinary and very extraordinary, you see, to have it happening just 
So casually, in matter of fact, here the angels come around and mingle with men in this manner. And in Luke is, Luke is the, full, for, uh, the fullest, of course. He starts out telling a guy in the gospel, he says, I want you to get this straight. Everybody gets it all mixed up. And there are all sorts of reports going around now. And you see, they were. And they should not discredit it. But he says, I'm going to see, tell you how it really happened. And so this account, when they go to the tomb, what do they see? 24 and 4. There's not an Aeoniscan this time. It's, uh, yeah, well. And they didn't find him, yes. Helen of the Ton Lethan, they moved beside the tomb, Calypso, and then the fourth verse says, Kaginito into Apotrepsio tas peritutu kaidudu. And then they, they, uh, and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And uh, when they started talking about this, then behold, it says there were two men, a pestison, autis, on a city, and they were standing there, uh, appeared to them, and they were clothed in garments like lightning. Now, now it's two men in the tomb, not in the tomb. They were, and they were standing. They were not sitting. They were standing. But it gives us some clinical detail and some more detail. And for Bondigan, and they were terrified at this object, and they hid their faces about right down to the ground, their heads on the ground. Uh, and uh, the two said to them, why are you living for the, looking for the living among the dead? This is a tomb. He's not here. He's not, you don't look for the living here. Who okay, so he isn't here, but he's risen. You remember how he spoke to you the time in Galilee? Oh, well, yes, how he spoke to you uh, still concerning the times in Galilee and so forth, and you have to go there and meet him. And then, and they remembered then his words, and they turned away uh, from the, and they left the tomb and told all these things to the eleven apostles. To all these, to the rest of the, all the rest of the eleven, and they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the son of the daughter of James, and there were some others with them. They weren't alone when they went there. and the others who were with them, they went and told the apostles to it, and Caiaphas and Opinau to Hosper, and what did the apostles say? You wonder why the Christians don't believe it today. They wouldn't believe it then. There's a possibility. The apostles said, you're crazy, when they told them the story. You notice this 11th verse. Caiaphas in an opium out tone, was a lay restaurant and appeared to them, to the 11, that the women were simply speaking a lot of nonsense, a lay out of their heads. Caiaphas did not have any refused to believe them. So here are the, Jesus' own disciples, whom he told he would rise from the dead and so forth. When they said it was so, they wouldn't believe it. See how hard this is to take? They couldn't take it. The Christian fathers couldn't take it. The churches don't take it today. And two of them, then the story of two of them going along the road to Emmaus, and they were talking to each other uh, all about the things that had happened. And we're on the 15th verse now. And while they were talking, uh, and Sujitin, uh, Autos, there came and appeared to them uh, somebody walking beside them along the road, quite close. You see, somebody keeping pace with them, came closer to them and walked along with them. And then they suddenly recognized who it was. It says their eyes were, were overcome to me. To me epignosi, so that they couldn't, didn't recognize who it was. They're a kratom to him. How would their eyes be overcome? They couldn't recognize it. And he said to them, uh, what were the words which antibalant to prosalelis, which you were just talking about as you walked along? You were having an argument as you walked, antibalant says, you were having an argument, what were you talking about? Uh, and then they, st they stood stark still, very much upset, almost angry. Skithropoi means angry, upset, uh, taken aback. They stopped when they were walking down the road, a dramatic scene, Apocrites de Sonomity Cleopas and Apocrites de Ace. And one of them answered, who was named Cleopas, and he said uh, to him, Sumanus paro kai Jerusalem kai uke ignos. You, 
alone, the only person who's been to Jerusalem and hasn't heard about it. So they talk about the crucifixion and so forth. Uh, up to see. Well, here we go again. Okay, I can rest in the section. That's the 22nd verse. But certain women from us, and Stasis and from us, Genomani or Orthena, who came very early uh, to the tomb, and they found the body, uh, well, to find, <laughs> of course, to find the body, and they went and they said, and they said they saw an angel with their, with their own eyes. See? An angel became visible to them. Ooh, like I see in there. But him, we, the lady, but the women reported that they didn't see, they saw the angels there, but they didn't see him. And he appeared to them, and he says, this is what he says to them, Oh, you stupid people, I know it's still a modern Greek word for stupid, dumb. Oh, you stupid and slow-witted people, brothers tekardia, slow-hearted, slow Stupid people, stupid and, and dumb, slow-thinking people, to bestow and to be passing, not to believe all things that were spoken by the holy prophets. And then beginning with, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them all that had happened, and it was only then that they began to understand what was happening. The Lord was with them, as in the Book of Mormon, he opens the scriptures, beginning with Moses, and explains all the things that were to happen to them, and he had to do that before their eyes were, uh, uh, were open. Uh, and then, we're at the 31st verse, and then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And in a moment, instantly, he became invisible. He, he vanished from them. See, so this would keep you off, off balance all the time. And they said, we should have known all along. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he met us on the road there and started explaining the scriptures to us? Uh, and, uh, that he was, and then after, he was seen of others. Uh, this is what happened after that. And he, he found the, the eleven when they were met together, and those that were with the eleven, and they said that they, ontos, they that really the Lord had uh, arisen from the dead, and he had appeared to Simon. And notice all these different reports going around. Kaito and and those that met him on their own, Kaihos Agnathan Autos and Teklasik, and they recognized him when he ate bread with them, when he ate with them, when he broke bread with them, then they knew who it was. He says there, Kaidi Auton Lalan to Autos Este and Mesotan. And Tauta de Auton Lalan Ton. And while they were speaking and talking about these things among themselves, these were, then he appeared among them again in the midst of them while they were talking about these things. Tatianzas Ka Impo. And they, of course, stopped. Tatianzas, they were all struck dumb. This, the conversation stopped instantly, and they were afraid, and uh, they thought they had seen a ghost, a spirit here. Now, this is what the Christian world says it was. Well, of course, it was the Christ spirit who returned to them. Their, their fallen memories, they built the cult around it and so forth. And he said to them, why are you so upset? And why do you argue about these things? Dialogue is more, the word dialogue. Why do you argue about these things? Uh, on a basic I, uh, and, uh, these things, why do these things enter into your heart? Behold, these are my hands, and these are my foot, feet, and I it, and they will prove to you that I am I. Remember, he does that to the Nephites too. He introduces himself that way. Behold, these are my hands, and these are my feet, that showing that it is really me. <laughs> Come and feel me. Come and feel and see a flesh. Uh, and you will see that a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see for yourself that I have. He's trying, to, doing everything he can to prove that he is not a spirit. The Gospels all emphasize that, so what does the Christian world say? He was a spirit, of course. It was the, the Christ spirit that came to them. That I am not a spirit, he says. Uh, and, but, notice that, but he saw they still wouldn't believe him. Why? That explains why, you see. It was too good to be true. Because of their joy and amazement. These things just don't happen, you see. Because of their joy and amazement, they wouldn't accept it. Uh, so, he said, all right, he needs some more proof. You still won't believe it, he says. Do you have any food in the house? Eketa brosaman in Do you have any food in the house, you see? And they said, 
These things stick together. Oh, do they? Uh, and they brought out, yes, and they brought out to, to him a, uh, a broiled fish, a baked fish, uh, a piece of broiled fish, and uh, he took that in their presence and he ate it. Exodus up to Elmeros, a part of it. Kaya Labanon and open them, and he says, Apen did prosaton hutoi lagan. And then, uh, these are things, uh, these things I told, told you, I spoke to you while I was still with you, that the words of Moses would have to be fulfilled and so forth. But he calls for the fish and the honeycomb, and he eats before them. This in, uh, in the uh, 27th chapter of uh, Matthew, Mark. Did I get Mark? Uh, is where he really goes into it. No, that's John. He eats to say he calls for honeycomb and so forth. Well, do we have anything else here? Uh, well, we see from Luke here that there's something different about him. It was the eating, it says in the 35th verse, it was the eating that convinced him. But there was, some, was he a ghost? And they doubt, and he has a body, and, and this is what he tells the Nephites, what he tells them in the 44th verse. And this is the thing which I taught the Jews at Jerusalem. This is what my gospel has been all along. And <coughs> He explains the scriptures in the 45th verse, and he orders Thomas, do you know, ton to noon. And then he says, their minds were open, and they began to understand the scriptures. So he taught them, and he preached them, but we don't have the sermon that he gave to them. This is important here. So, but let's get on to uh, John here. Now, we find in John 20, Mary is on the spot, and, uh, mm -hmm. and what, how does, her experience described here, again in meticulous detail, 26 and 7. Yeah. Erica died in Unkai Soman Petrus, Apocaluthan, Autoka, Esilthan. I'm not in the wrong chapter, that's why. Uh, this is the old uh, Nestle edition. It has it's 30 different texts here with all the variant readings and so forth. Can you see if somebody disagrees with somebody? No two are alike. But uh, here we are then. Oh, this is very strange. Oh, here we are, yes. Yes, now, then came Simon Peter following them, following him, and went into the well, this is the young man that followed him, first of all. I better start at the beginning of the chapter here. Now, it was the first day, early, the dawn of the Sabbath, the beginning of the Sabbath, when Mary Magdalene went protis cotias, the first light, when it was still dark, more dark than light, and she went to the, the tomb, and she saw that the, that the uh, stone had been removed from the tomb, and... Uh, and she ran and told Simon Peter about it. It's another account. Well, Simon Peter account. Huh? And she told it to the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Modest John, he isn't mentioning his own name here, you see. And uh, she said to them, uh, the Lord has risen from the tomb. He's left the tomb. And I, we don't know uh, where they put him. She's very much worried about this because she wants to perform the funeral or the rites of the dead and so forth. Not the Roman ones. Okay. And Peter went out and the other disciples to see if that was really true. And they went to the tomb. And uh, the, the two of them walked along together. And the other disciple, the, the second one, uh, he ran faster than Peter did and he got there first got to the tomb first, and he bent over, and he looked in, uh, and he saw then, now notice how clinically exact he said, he saw <coughs> the sash, the othonia, the uh, sort of sather towel, humentoi uh, eseltum, himenata blippent, that they were not, uh, but he saw the, the garments there, but he didn't go in. Yes. And so Simon Peter went and caught up with him, and uh, he went right into the tomb, and he saw the garments there, Othonia, the, the white garments, Othon, it's linen actually, uh, lying there, and he saw the sudarian, that's the Roman word for towel, the, the cloth around the head, and he saw the sudarian lying there, an epitit, which had been on his head, there they were neatly folded, lying there, and uh, it's all too physical for words, no wonder the, the fathers couldn't take it. Umeditonothion came in a la chorus, but 
Notice he wants to make particular, but the, the towel, the, the Sudarian, notice that's the Roman Sudarian, a, a sweatband. The Sudarian wasn't with the other clothes, but it was in a separate place, uh, in another place. And uh, then when the, the other one went in, both of the disciples are now in the tomb, uh, and he saw and he believed what he had seen. Uh, because up that time, they hadn't understood the scriptures that he really would be resurrected. Now he's beginning to understand, John, as you see. They ought to arise from the dead. And so they went back and told the other disciples. But Maria sta Mary stayed there uh, near the tomb, and she was crying. She thought it was all over. Uh, and Hosun, uh, a Parak, Suksun, Hastamayan. And while she was crying, she leaned over too and looked into the tomb and she saw there two white angels. Now it's a different kind. She saw, two, well the other saw two men too. And she saw two angels. Of course they were angels. The angel was just a messenger. Two angels in white garments sitting there. The others were standing there. Well I guess they got tired of standing. I don't know. But when Mary went there they were sitting. Uh, sitting there. Uh, one at the head and one at the foot of where he had lain. Where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? And she said to them, because they took the Lord away, and I don't know where they put him. And uh, when she said these things, she turned and looked behind her, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize who it was. No, so he doesn't come in glory now. It's an ordinary human being. He's got to let us know. Till he's finished his mission here, he's just one of us. Uh, and Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Whom are you looking for? And she thought it was the gardener. So you can see early in the morning when it was still dark, he obviously wasn't an overpowering presence or anything. She thought it was the gardener. Came up to, pl to hoe around the, the gardener and the tomb. It's the garden tomb, I suppose. She thought it was the gardener. <coughs> and she said to him, Sir, if you have taken him, could you please tell me where you took him? Uh, and... Uh, and I'll, come and, t and I'll come and get him and leg after him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, don't you recognize him? Mary. And she whirled around and she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, Lord, and so on. So she recognizes him and uh, he says, don't touch me and so forth. So these different stories we have. And, but I'm going to my father later and then, then we can get together. And then this very same day, uh, which was the first of the Sabbath, in the Sabbath, the doors being still closed, the disciples were met together and they were scared to death right after the crucifixion because of fear they'd locked the doors, because of fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood right in the middle of them. And he said to them, Shalom Lakon. Irene Humin, peace be with you. See, that's literally peace. That's what he said, Shalom Lakon. Uh, and uh, when he said this, he showed them, notice he shows them the tokens because they are the apostles. He showed them the signs in his hands and in his side, he said. And they were utterly rejoiced when they saw that, that they saw it was the Lord. And he said to them, again, peace be with you again, he repeated, you see. And as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And he immediately taught, tells them to go out and baptize and start, talks talking about baptism just like that. Remember, my father, remember the first thing he says in the Book of Mormon, this is my father's gospel. That the, that the, this is my gospel that the Father calls upon all men everywhere to repent, right like that, to go out and preach repentance. He does, and to receive the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them and said to them they should receive the Holy Ghost. And Thomas doubted, as you know, because he wasn't there, um, because he wasn't there when Jesus was there. He had to see, but the others saw too. Don't blame Thomas for for doubting. They would have doubted too. They were doubting. Remember when the ladies told them about it, they doubted. So don't blame Thomas because when he, all he saw in, in two seconds, he said, my Lord, my God, just like that. But he didn't get to see it till a week later. This happened a week later. And uh, then there were, and then he says in the 30th verse, and this turns out, then there were many other signs he did uh, in the presence of the apostles. But they are not written down in this book. How to get up to Pastelon. But these are, are written down. What is written down, he says, is written so that Jesus you may know that Jesus is the Christ. This is the purpose of the Book of Mormon. This is why they write the Gospel. But John says, these things are written so that you know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you may 
and that you may have eternal life in his name, that you may have life in his name. So it's very important to write these things down. If it happened to the Nephites, they, they have to write it too. And uh, this fifth gospel, you're not going to leave things out there, and even where he tells the same things. But some things are different here. Well, we have this in John, and then the... Uh, so this is only part of the story. He did much else. But now... Luke is the one that wants to go into particulars. Luke is the physician. He's not the Jew, you notice. And he, he goes into, he introduces his gospel. He wants to take particular care that people get this right. He's going to describe everything exactly as it is. And then he talks the first, the first verse of his gospel. He says, people are all getting mixed up about this. He wrote the, the Acts too, and he talk, that's why he wrote the Acts. And uh, he already mentioned, Luke talk about the 40 days here. But, well, I'm going to mention Luke again, is that he starts the Acts of the Apostles by saying, the first doctrine is gone, is gone. many people have had this, the things that had happened through his, the Holy Spirit and so forth, that everybody's getting mixed up. And then we get to the third verse, the very four, uh, third verse. To whom, Kai Parestis and Helton, to whom he showed himself living after he had suffered, after he had suffered death, by many signs and wonders. Through 40 days, they were in his presence and saw him. Not just, just three times. Can lego on top periatum basilus with him? Well, we go back here already in, uh, in John. Uh, Matthew, he comes back three days. They see him for three days. And in Book of Mormon, you see, they come back. But these 40 days he comes back. He visits them, and the, the word he uses, sunalizomonus. He came and built and camped with us. He's, he paid uh, visits to us, like a person camping uh, with somebody. He came and camped with us off and on for a period of 40 days teaching that. Well, that would give them plenty of time to become familiar with him. It wouldn't have been a miracle or a, a terrifying thing anymore, the way you find in the Book of Mormon. And the, oh my land. And the, uh, the Gospels then labor to make us see Christ not as a myth or a mystery. His public appearances continue after his death. This is something which John says, remember John then writes a letter. The first verse of the first letter he says of John, he says, this is all something we saw with our eyes, heard, felt with our hands. Don't get the eye. And they say, oh, John is so spiritual, nothing but spirit here. And he says, how can I make it clearer? We saw with our eyes and we felt with our hands. But no, they won't take that at all. <laughs> He says they were frightened, taken aback, puzzled by the unexpected, but plainly it's not on our level. And he condescends to show that he is of our nature, rather he belongs to the family. He uses all the fa familiar words, and the family words in the Bible. Of course, fathers, the son, well, those are only used in connection with familiar relationships. Yet we see, we call him our father, the Lord tells him in the Lord's Prayer. There to address him, God is our, his father, as our father. Well, that sounds like father. That sounds like, like a father, if you ask me. Can't they use an, a better word if it's not a father? So that's the last thing in the world he really was. The fathers of the church complain that. So we have this, this one focal point then. The, uh, in Third Nephi, we get the same thing now here. Remember, just briefly here. Jesus comes to them, and how does he come to them? As a man in a white robe, uh, Third Nephi 11 and 8. He doesn't come in uh, overpowering glory. They don't know who it is, see. They thought it was an angel, we're told in the ninth verse. It's that. Right? And he introduces himself simply and directly. He says, behold, I am Jesus Christ. Just like that. After all this buildup, I see you expect uh, uh, Lucas and uh, the, uh, the special effects people to go all out for... Uh, of the second sort, confrontations of the second sort or something like that. Uh, but... Uh, and then he establishes identity by signs and tokens in the 15th verse. That's the purpose of signs and tokens, to, for people to rec a mutual recognition is the purpose. And uh, then there it was an exchange of greetings. He not only circulated freely, he said he ministered and had a personal, uses the word ministered, circulated among them freely, and had a personal interview with every individual. The 17th chapter, 25th, 21st verses. One by one, he introduced himself to them, called him by name, and uh, showed the, the signs, the tokens of him, and he uh, took them one by one, including the little children, 17, 11, 17, 21, and he took the children aside and blessed them and taught them one by one. So it's the personal relationship here. 
Remember, it tells us in 2 Nephi 9.41, the Holy One of Israel is the keeper of the gate, and he employs no servant there. When you finally go to the veil and meet the Lord, there will not be a substitute. He will know you, and you will know him. Notice, if it takes all day, he comes. And then he comes again and again. Now, if, the, if you met uh, General Sawyer, he said at a conference, and you met him the second day after, you'd know him pretty well. You'd recognize him. And the third day, you'd say, hello, brother so-and-so, and you'd be old friends by then. And then it says, after that, as in the 40 days, he came often to them after that, and, and this is uh, 613, 1613, he came often to them after that and ate with them, as he does in the New Testament, to make sure that, because whenever you come together and make a party and get together, what do you do? In the Near East or anywhere else, you eat, of course. You, you don't ever have somebody visit you, you have having something to eat, so he ate with them. And so the New Testament a, a confirms this account. The... Uh, so now we go to the Book of Mormon account. We don't want to hang up on it, but we must know these things are real, and this is the thing that people can't get into their heads. If they are, that changes the picture for us. We have nothing to worry about, but...